MW Industries, perfectly safe. This is the first time the audience gets to see their protagonist, Bo, from Ari Aster's 2023 film, Bo is Afraid. A static shot of a closed door, followed by a man opening that door to reveal Bo standing in front of an aquarium. There are a number of interesting things happening here. First, there is the door. Then, there is the man. And finally, there is the aquarium. Because the scene is out of context, these elements will mean nothing to you if you haven't seen the film. But once you finish the film, you will learn that this scene not only describes what kind of person Bo is, but also what kind of person his mother is, and their relationship. And this idea expands to define a critical characteristic of all Ari Aster films, that they feel partial. In most Ari Aster films, the stories that unfold on screen are only portions of a bigger universe, a focused examination of a single chapter out of a book. And the details necessary to understand the actual story are often left outside the contained narrative. This means that in order to realize the bigger picture, you must see the forces that are external to the film text. Take his 2018 film Hereditary. The presumed protagonist of this film is Annie. She has the most screen time, the most dialogue, and every event happens seemingly because of her. But in reality, it's Annie's deceased mother, Ellen, who is in true control. She's the one who has orchestrated everything, passing down the curse to her daughter's family to fulfill what she herself has failed. This curse, of course, is King Payman, the horse-riding jackass spirit who enters Peter's body at the end and who, similar to Ellen, never really appears on screen. Instead, the film alludes to their existence. Ellen is shown through a series of photos and as a figurine Annie has built, and King Payman, well, through its perspective. If you look at how the film starts and ends, the two seemingly irrelevant shots both feature a diorama-like perspective. These shots imply Payman's point of view, and how the fate of all characters have been more or less set from the start. In essence, Hereditary is telling a story of a daughter who is desperately trying to free herself from the grasp of her mother, whose influence continues even after death, or in the case of the audience, outside the film text. And that is strikingly similar to how Ari Aster's latest work, Bo is Afraid, is structured. While the majority of the film centers around Bo's surreal journey back home, it is Bo's mother, Mona, who commands the world surrounding Bo's existence. And like Hereditary, the film leaves crucial details about Bo's past and Mona's influence outside the frame, this time with a more meta approach. Before we re-examine the film through Mona's perspective, let's be clear about one thing. You do not figure Bo is afraid out. That's not the point of the film, nor is it possible to do so. Also, I love my blue paint, so it feeling like I'm chugging a bucket of paint for three hours is fine with me, but it may be death for you, and that too is okay. Bo is Afraid is one of the most divided films of 2023, with some people obsessing over it more than Mona does with Bo, and some hating it more than Bo hates going home. That actually sums up the film annoyingly well. But watching a film at the end of the day is a subjective experience, and since daring films like Bo is Afraid tend to have more exaggerated positives and negatives, it is inevitable that some disagree with your sentiments about the film. It's really a matter of what tickles your fancy, and I'm not here to discuss personal preferences. What I'm here to do is offer a new angle, a specific angle that helps understand how Ari Aster constructs his film world, not a definitive solution to the mystery or an overall run-through of the film. For how long? With that out of the way, there are two ways to re-watch Bo is Afraid. The first way is to focus on Bo's interaction with water, which functions as a symbolic presence of Bo's mother in his world. There are roughly 16 scenes in Bo's Afraid in which water either visually fills up the frame or plays a key role in progressing the scene. First, let's examine how the film starts and ends like we did with Hereditary. In the very first scene, we see the moment Bo is born, leaving his mother's womb. In the very last scene, Bo enters a cave to a symbolic womb before his death. Solely looking at these two scenes makes water synonymous with the amniotic fluid, the nurturing and loving embrace of a mother that gives life to her child. But as you know, this same water is exactly what takes his life away. The idea of amniotic fluid, therefore, should be taken both as a loving protection and an enslavement, a great representation of Mona's twisted love. 
And it's this inescapable grasp of his mother that constantly follows his life wherever he goes. Just reconsider how Bo is first introduced to the audience after the title drop. The static shot directs the attention of the audience to the door. The closed door functions as a cinematic rejection, denying spotlight to whatever is behind it. On a narrative level, this is indicative of Bo's lack of autonomy, that he has no say in anything until another person, or considering how this man is hired by Mona until his mother allows him to speak. Finally, there is the aquarium, or water. Bo longingly staring at this aquarium suggests not that he purely misses his mother, but that his dependence has been forced by his mother. He is simply compelled to think about her. First, because he is about to visit her. I'm visiting my mother tomorrow. And second, because her influence is everywhere, including this office. Whether this contemplation is positive or negative has no significance. What matters is the mandatory nature of this meditation. If the last time you were thirsty, you went to a well and the water made you sick, are you going to go back to that specific well expecting it to be safe? From this point on, every scene with water in Act 1 coincides with the reminder of Bo's mother. If the reminder is neutral, the role of water is also neutral. Like in this scene, where Bo talks about his plans to visit his mother, and the therapist prescribes him with a new anxiety medication that must be taken with water. Always with water. But if Bo upsets Mona by missing his flight, for instance, then he will have no water. In this first act, water represents Mona's care, a spiteful reminder of how Bo cannot live without her. Again, this isn't a self-motivated realization, but an infliction. It's the building, or Mona really, who has cut off water to Bo's apartment and got his credit card declined in the convenience store. She has suspended Bo from accessing her care and love, I say this very loosely, and now he is going to die, like John Merrimack, rest in peace. Mona's love is transactional, rather than relational. If he receives it, he must pay for it. I got it honey! So what happens when the water is back in Bo's life and he can now immerse himself in it? Overflow. In other words, too much water, causing just as much havoc as having no water. There's never a healthy balance to the amount of water Bo finds, which is perfectly in line with how Mona has treated Bo all his life. And likewise, Bo simultaneously desires to be free from Mona's control and finds comfort in its stability. But like I said, whether Bo seeks it or runs away from it doesn't really matter because both actions signal the same thing. That Mona has led Bo to be the man he is today, conflicted by his thoughts, unable to commit to either extremes. He's on the couch! Isn't it truly funny that this is the moment Bo learns his mother has passed away and the water from the bathtub is literally still trying to catch him? This is why Act 3 is the only section where water takes on a slightly different role. Because this segment tells a story of Mona's defeat, albeit an imaginary one. There may be a great flood separating Bo's family, and he still may be subject to his fear. But in this story, he manages to confess and admit to his own character, replacing the earth with good water. But his childhood trauma is too strong for this fictitious world. The enveloping presence of his mother is like that of an island surrounded by water. So will he choose to drown or die of dehydration? Drink lots of water. The price of uncertainty for Bo is self-blame. At the end of his journey, he returns to Mona's womb in a state of guilt. Again, the first and the last shot of the film connects as if it's a loop. There's a mythical energy to Bo's odyssey seen through this lens. A tragic tale of an unalterable fate, like that imposed by King Payman. It's no coincidence that Mona's last name is Wasserman, which is how they pronounce it in the film, but in German, for example, it's pronounced Wasser, and it literally means water. This brings us to the second way of watching this film, which is to focus on Bo's interaction with MW Industries, a literal representation of Mona's control. 
This being a non-symbolic approach naturally highlights the specifics of filmmaking, such as mise-en-scene or the script, rather than its overall build. But it still interacts with the different themes as well as with the main symbol of the film, water, to a great extent. After all, Ari Aster has gone as far as to create a LinkedIn page and an Instagram account for MW Industries even before the film's release, where people could send messages and sign up to their newsletter to communicate with the fictional company. Although the marketing department would have had some say in this, I doubt Ari Aster would have gone along with it if he himself didn't find it meaningful. Ari Aster is a very meticulous filmmaker. He never does anything without a purpose, especially on screen, and only uses calculated audiovisual details in the world he is building. But never has he done something this detailed. Bo is Afraid is packed with information. Using spatial depth and lateral tracking movements, the film reveals new visual information with the camera, while also having numerous visual layers for the audience to examine or miss. Listen to your mother when I tell you to not be my This can easily feel overwhelming and tiresome on your brain, which is why the first act has the most number of layers, because this act establishes and emphasizes Bo's anxious character. And if you pay attention to these details, you will find Mona's influence in every sector of Bo's life. You can find it on a giant billboard, microwave, frozen dinner, TV commercial, dental floss, and even in the streets. But it's not just the MW logo that signals Mona's invisible presence. It's also the words, audible and visible. Guilty foreshadows the verdict Bo receives at the end of the film. Stop incriminating yourself indicates the way to get out of Mona's grip. This, this is, is your, your decision, decision reveals what Mona's test for Bo is. You failed your stupid test, suggests Bo has already blown his last chance. I know is a direct wink at the therapist's involvement in this trial, as well as the I'm so sorry. And while on the subject of voicemails, leave me a message if you ever want to speak to me again. Perfectly sums up the one-sided relationship between Bo and Mona, especially since the message won't even go through. The test was never designed to be passed. Mona is only self-confirming her beliefs by making Bo fail. Now, at first, these written and spoken verbal cues carry little weight and never stand out to a point of distraction. For instance, while it is weird to write guilty instead of guilt, the audience can easily assume that the therapist was writing from Bo's perspective. Are well, you feeling guilty about that? It's only when Bo arrives at Mona's place at the end that everything clicks. Every verbal information was coming from employees of MW Industries. In retrospect, Roger's perfectly Hello? timed phone calls, the security cameras, and the blinking red light at the therapist's office all lead to Mona's constant surveillance. Bo was being monitored 24-7 by those working for Mona, even outside his apartment. In fact, the loving and caring environment Roger's family provides stays in line with how Mona would, yet again, manipulate Bo into learning that nothing can replace her way of loving, and that his wish for something different is but an immature fantasy distant from reality. I mean, just think about the song playing during the scene with Elaine. Always be my baby? That's next level malevolence if you ask me. And speaking of home, even Bo's apartment turns out to be Mona's property used as a rehab center for people who have abused MW products. An ironic statement considering how their slogan is perfectly safe. It's a great illustration of how the real world probably isn't nearly as dangerous as Mona's world. The MW products that help Bo live his life, ranging from everyday appliances, food, and grooming kits to medications and residence are also constraining him from truly living his life as an independent person. <laughs> Disregarding the objective reality, the problems you see Bo face are serving as an allegory for the control that Mona has over him. In this sense, watching Bo is Afraid from MW's or Mona's perspective turns the entire film into a show that Mona has put together, with Bo as the main character, going through a series of tests to eventually stand before his mother for his final trial. 
After all, this film or this adventure is produced by MW Industries, isn't it? So what yields? Well, not much if you found the film too confusing on your first run, because I barely touched on the most memorable sections of the film, like the attic. Yeah. Look, I could go into details about those sequences, but my intentions here were never to go through the film beat by beat. As mentioned, this film isn't meant to be solved. You certainly can find the film subjectively enjoyable or meaningful, or at least refreshing if you're more into cinematic achievements than narrative coherence. But Bo is Afraid is most definitely not for anyone actually at its core, whether you happen to resonate with it or not, because it is absolutely first and foremost intended for Ari Aster himself. But then again, isn't every creation personal? And doesn't that mean that it is for everyone as much as it is for no one? I think the beauty of this type of film is in its ability to make things literal, not necessarily connecting it to an objective truth. In that case, the penis monster would be very real and that would, yeah. But in terms of what the film is doing on a cinematic level, that his father was described as a device, a giant semen bag to bring Bo to life. But it also functions on a narrative level. Instead of trying to distinguish real from fake or interpret various dialogue that range from realistic to downright absurd, take everything as it is presented with the mindset of a fever dream. When Mona says that Bo made up the story of losing his apartment key, don't try to figure out who is lying and what is real. Rather, focus on the dynamic between the two characters. Otherwise, you will eventually hit a wall. How the f will anyone solve Bo seeing into the future with that TV channel, right? That scene simply illustrates the predetermined nature of the events governed by Mona's godlike omniscience and omnipresence. This is, as many have stated, a surreal Truman show with an absurdist premise. After all, not one person acts normally, not even the people in the forest. Everyone either overreacts or underreacts, and this can be a mixture of Bo's exaggerated perception and his mother's manipulative lies. Have the correct mindset and enjoy, because the intricacies do not matter. The only thing real is that this little place right next to Bo's apartment is one of the best bars in existence. I know this because the film was shot in my city and I used to go to this bar like my life depended on it. And if you're wondering how a street can look this bad, the actual place is way worse so imagine that. If such a place can exist in real life, what can't in a film? Actually, I, I don't know. Let me ask my mom. 